welcome to Rainier View. My name is Michelle, and we're so glad you're joining us. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in making other people happy that we wear ourselves down, but there is life found when we live to please God. Let's continue in our series called Good News for Everyone. Here's Pastor Mike. Well, hey everybody, I'm Mike, and uh, I'm glad that you're here watching today. And uh, I don't know if you know this about me, but for my entire life, I have been a people pleaser. It's just kind of part of who I've been e ever since I was a kid. My desire is I want to be able to help other people. I want to make other people feel good. I, I, want, to, I want to keep things positive. And so ever since I was a kid, like I have been trying to please people, whether it was my parents or my friends, teachers at school, sports coaches, teammates as I got older, you know, my, my wife, my family, you know, the, the pastors that I served under. When I became a pastor, it was the congregation that I was serving. The list goes on and on and on when it comes to the people that I have tried to please in my life. And if you're a people pleaser, you probably already know this, but, but there's a major challenge to living life that way. And that is that there is no way to do it right. You cannot be the right kind of a people pleaser because there's no right way. You know, as the old saying goes, you can't please everyone. Now I started thinking about that saying and I kind of wondered, who said that originally? And so I went to the interwebs of all places to find out who, who said that quote originally, and I discovered that there are a lot of quotes about pleasing everybody. Quotes from philosophers ranging from Aristotle to Abraham Lincoln to Kanye West. And one of the quotes that I read that really resonated with me was this. I can't tell you the key to success, but I know the key to failure is trying to please everyone, okay? And uh, I, I deliberately created that slide right there uh, in, in a terrible font, uh, and I quoted somebody because on the interwebs, that quote is uh, attributed to three different people numerous times, so I have no idea who originally said it, so I'm just gonna say that came from somebody. Now, as you're watching right now, I don't know what you believe. I don't know what your faith story is. I don't know if you believe in God, if you call Jesus Lord of your life. But to be honest, it doesn't matter because no matter who you are, if you're watching right now, I need to let you know of the inherent danger when we try to please everybody. And what will happen is that we unknowingly attach our self-worth to whether or not we are making others happy. Now, you may be watching this going like, well, I am, I'm not a people pleaser. I don't really care what other people think. I don't care if I make other people happy or not. I'm going to do me. Like, chances are there's at least one person in your life that you really want to make happy. Even if you're not a people pleaser, there's probably somebody that you really want to make happy. And there can be a danger associated with that, whether it's one person you're trying to please or the entire world that you're trying to please. And what happens is that when I do something that pleases somebody else, my self-worth goes up. I feel good about myself. Conversely, when I do something and I upset somebody else, I disappoint them, I, I let somebody else down, I anger them, then my self-worth takes a nosedive and I don't feel good about myself. This is an exhausting way to live. There's no way that you can maintain it because no matter how hard I try, I'm always going to end up disappointing somebody. That, that's just kind of how life goes because if I'm making somebody happy, chances are that action is going to make somebody else unhappy because I did for this person what I didn't do for that person and it just goes on and on and on. Now, if you're already feeling kind of stressed out based on what I've spent the first few minutes talking about, I, I have some good news for you. You know, this is a series called Good News for Everyone. And, and so this is what you need to know today. The good news is that when we focus on pleasing God, we are free from the pressure to please people. Now, to see how Jesus lived this out, we're going to be in Luke chapter 4 today. And so if you have the Bible or the Bible app on our device, you can find your way over to, to Luke chapter 4. And as we get into the passage today, we're going to see how Jesus lived his life only seeking to please God. Whether or not it upset other people, he was going to please God first and foremost. And with that being said, we're going to be in Luke 4. I'm going to start in verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. 
He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? So at this point uh, in the story of the gospel, Jesus' public ministry has already begun. Uh, and he is becoming the topic of conversation everywhere across the countryside because of the, the messages that he has been preaching and more so the miraculous works that he has been doing. And as he's been in his travels, he's visiting the local synagogues, you know, the, the local Jewish houses of worship, and, and he's often invited to, uh, to preach the, the sermon that day when he was in town. And, uh, you know, due to his growing notoriety or his celebrity, you know, everybody wants to hear Jesus speak in their synagogue and he's crushing it. He is absolutely crushing it. Week in and week out, he is preaching preaching messages that people are just blown away at his wisdom and his understanding. And as the passage states, everybody praised him. Okay, like I've been preaching for quite some time right now. I don't know if I've ever had a a sermon where everybody praised me, okay, but I'm sure it would would feel great. did you ever have a time in life when, when life kind of felt that way? Like maybe it was when you were in school and, and maybe you turned in a test or maybe you just had this run of success where like every test came back with an A, every report was, was, was you know, praised, everything, you know, your teacher was writing, you know, in red pen at the top, like great job, like you're doing really well, like it's a great feeling. Or maybe it was a work, uh, you, had a, you had a project assigned to you and it was just this big, hairy, massive project but you nailed it, and the boss you know, made sure to tell everybody, like, man, you did a great job. Or maybe it was something even as simple as, as maybe a meal you prepared for your family, and it was so good that, that like, everybody just wolfed it down. They wanted seconds, like, when can you make this again? Now, personal note, that hasn't happened to me yet uh, in cooking for my family, and it probably never will, but, but I'm sure it would feel great. Well, Jesus has been regularly experiencing these kinds of reactions as he's been traveling from village to village, from town to town, and now he's heading into his hometown of Nazareth to the people that are are most likely, you know, really excited to hear him talk because this is the local boy. And and here he is, he's come back home, and, and on the Sabbath day, the Jewish day of rest, you know, he goes to the synagogue, perhaps with his family, and when he gets there, he is invited to, you know, give the reading for the day as well as the message. And and in my mind, I just kind of picture this scene where, you know, the the local rabbi or or the the teacher of the law gets up, gets everybody's attention like, hey, everybody, Joe and Mary's kid Jesus is here today. You've all heard about him. Man, we all remember him running around in the streets. Well, he's here today and he's going to read the message. So give your attention to Jesus, Joe and Mary's kid. And Jesus handed the roll, this, this, this scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he opens it up to a very specific passage. You know, it, it, we can look back and it's in Isaiah chapter 61. Back in Jesus' time, it was just a long scroll. It wasn't divided by chapter and verse. But, but he, he went to this passage that was going to be familiar to everybody. Everybody knew the passage that he was quoting from. Because the Jewish teachers of the law, they interpreted and they taught this passage to be about the Messiah, God's Savior of the world. And he begins uh, his, his, his sermon by saying something really strange. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You can imagine the looks that people were giving each other when he opened up his message with these words, you know, the, the, the whispers, like... Did he just say what I think he said? Is he saying that he's the Messiah? Like, what what is he talking about? I mean, if you want to talk about a memorable hook to a message, there you go. Just claim that you are the Messiah. Everybody's going to be just locked in on what you're saying. Now, Luke, the the author of this gospel, he, he doesn't record what Jesus says after this. 
But, but, but I believe what, what happens is that Jesus goes on to, to talk about this passage from Isaiah chapter 61 to declare what, what God had sent him to do, kind of looking at this passage and, and what God's anointed had come to do. You know how he talked about this anointed one who was anointed with the Spirit was going to come and he was going to proclaim good news to the poor. You know, the good news that, that through him that God's people would finally be free from, from the oppression that they had suffered under. You know, through him the blind would see, the sick would be healed. You know, how, how he had come to, to forgive people of their debt, that, that God's favor was going to rest on them. And we see, you know, in, in verse 22 as he's speaking, that people were amazed at what he was saying. Like they, they were taking it all in and they're just, just kind of blown away of like, oh my gosh, well, we haven't heard somebody talk like this before. But they couldn't get past his opener. They couldn't get past that hook. That, that today, that scripture that he'd read had been fulfilled in their hearing. He was claiming to be the Messiah. And so naturally, they wanted to see some proof of him being the Messiah. Don't just, don't just tell us about it, Jesus. Don't just give a sermon about being the Messiah. Can you show us some miracles? You know, they couldn't, they couldn't get past this idea. Again, this, this was Jesus, the, the little kid who was running through the streets all those years. This was Jesus, and you know, we talked about it two weeks ago. You know, Jesus, who at age 12 was left behind by his parents in Jerusalem for five days. Like, this same kid was now claiming to be the Messiah? Well, I, I need to see something. I need to see the miraculous. Jesus, you know, they're thinking, can, can you drive out a demon here like we've heard you do in other places? You know, we, we've got a blind man here in Nazareth. Can you, can you go heal him? There's a woman who's, who's bedridden with, with a fever. Can, can, you, can you heal her so she can get up? You know, Jesus, can you turn my water into wine? I, you know, can, can you do something? And Jesus knows this is what's on everybody's mind. He knows this is what everybody's thinking, and he has a choice to make at this point in time. Will he choose to please people and give them what they want, perform some kind of a miracle? Or will he choose to focus on the mission that his father gave him in choosing to please God? Well, let's, let's read and see what Jesus chooses, starting in verse 23. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what we've heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. So as we see, Jesus chooses not to perform a miracle to please the people in Nazareth. Because I think Jesus realizes, if I perform a miracle, they're just going to want another one, and then they'll want another one, and then they'll want another one. And to be honest, it won't matter how many miracles Jesus performs in his hometown, they're still not going to believe the Messiah because they still think of Jesus as that kid running around the dusty streets of Nazareth. They're just not going to believe. There was going to be no pleasing them. And so instead of performing a miracle, Jesus decides, well, let me teach you some more then. And, and this time he explains how, how the good news is for everyone as he recalls two separate accounts from the books of First and Second King, two of the, the history books from the Old Testament. And he first taught uh, on, on the prophet Elijah and how during a time in, in, in Israel's history, there were, there were a lot of widows who needed to be taken care of. And yet God sent Elijah to the foreign land of Sidon and how God used Elijah there to bless a Sidonian woman and her son who were frankly on, on the brink of starvation during this massive famine. 
And then Jesus went on to tell a second account, this time of the prophet Elisha. And and this was during a time in Israel's history where uh, there were a lot of Israelites who were suffering from the skin disease of leprosy. Okay, now if you want to ruin your appetite for whatever your next meal is, go ahead and Google, uh, do a Google image search of leprosy, and I guarantee uh, you will not be hungry. You may even lose your lunch. It's totally possible. So you may not want to do that. Um, but, But this horrific skin disease is affecting a lot of Israelites, and yet God sends Elisha to the foreign country of Syria to heal a particular Syrian named Naaman, who was the commander of the army of the Arameans. So Jesus, who had earlier claimed to be the Messiah, what he's telling the people of Nazareth is that I'm going to go beyond what Elijah and Elisha did. See, God had sent those two prophets to to bless an individual foreigner. But what Jesus is saying is that I have come to be good news for the entire world, Not, not just the Jewish people, but for everyone. I'm bringing spiritual freedom for everyone who would look to me and call me Lord, from Syrians to Sidonians to even their their present-day oppressors, the Romans. And I think this is something, even within the church today, that we often forget. We, We forget how God has called us to be a blessing to all people, to all people groups, not just people who look like us. You know, if we believe that the good news is for everyone, then we need to learn to recognize our own struggles with prejudice. You know, we need to, as a people, work hard towards racial reconciliation, knowing that, that Jesus didn't just come to die for one kind of person, that, that I shouldn't just look to, to worship with one kind of person. Jesus came for everyone. And this is a major reason why Jesus' audience goes from this place of being amazed at his words to being completely infuriated by his words. I mean, the Jews are sitting there going like, no, we're God's chosen people. And Jesus is suggesting something different. He's saying that he's for everybody. Well, wait a second. And and without even asking for any any clarification, without even asking a question, this this group of churchgoers immediately turns into a lynch mob with murder on their minds. And they drive him to the edge of town, to this cliff, with the intent to push him off the cliff and then throw rocks at him, stoning him until he was dead. (laughs) When we live to please God... There are going to be people that don't like what we do, and some people will roll their eyes at us, and there will be other people that that get frustrated with us. There will be others who may even get unreasonably angry. Hopefully, we don't experience somebody getting homicidal towards us, and yet, if it happened to Jesus, what's to say that that couldn't happen to us someday? And that's not to have us living in fear, but just the realization that if we live to please God, people are going to react in all kinds of ways. All that being said, if I live to please God, then the reactions of other people, whether positive or negative, will not ever affect my self-worth. You know, when I live to please God, I can be completely secure in who I am because God's love for me will never, ever change. Because God's love for me is not based upon whether I do more good than bad in this life. God's love for me is not based on whether I do more right than wrong. God's love for me never changes because of my behavior. And you may be asking, well, well, how do you know that? How can you be confident in that? Well, because God's love for me and God's love for you was defined on a cross over 2,000 years ago when Jesus willingly sacrificed himself for all of our sins, for all the wrong that we've done, for all the evil that we will do. Jesus loved us so much. God loved us so much that he allowed his son to die for us before we ever had a chance to do anything right or anything wrong, anything moral or immoral in our own eyes. That's the sacrifice that God made. That's the proof of his love. And so if you don't hear anything else this morning, I I need you to hear this. Everything changes 
when my desire to please God is a response to his love rather than an attempt to earn it. Again, everything changes when my desire to please God is a response to his love rather than an attempt to earn it. And once we understand that, again, everything will change. And and the first way that we can respond to God's love is is by confessing our sin, by admitting that that we need him to be the Lord of our lives, by, by confessing our sin and making Jesus Lord over everything. And that I want to please God because of what Jesus did for me. And in this life, there are going to be times when you are going to have to make decisions that will force you to choose who you're going to please. Maybe you have a boss at some point. Maybe he's already done this. Maybe she's already asked this. But maybe you have a boss that's asked you to do something unethical. Because ultimately, it's going to help the company's bottom line. Will you choose to please God or will you choose to please people? You know, if you're a student, maybe there's been some situations like this. Maybe you're going to have situations coming up where other students are going to ask you to cheat. They're they're going to want your homework. They're going to want test answers and you will have to make a choice. Will you choose to please God or will you choose to please people? Maybe there's a conversation that you're going to need to have, maybe a confrontation with somebody that you love, that they've been doing something that is just not healthy for them, it's not good for other people, and you've got to make a choice. Will I have this conversation and please God, or will I skip the conversation so that I can please people? So I want to ask you, has there been something that you've needed to do, a conversation that you've needed to have, a decision that you've needed to make that you have been putting off, that you have been avoiding, because you know what God wants you to do, or you have a pretty good idea of what God wants you to do, but you're afraid that if you do it, you're going to disappoint somebody else. You're going to let somebody else down. You're going to make them angry. And so you're just choosing not to make that decision. Well, in choosing not to make that choice, you are making a choice, but but ultimately you need to ask yourself in this situation, am I going to please God or will I please people? And and, and if that example has already come into your mind of that decision you need to make or the conversation that you need to have, I, I want you to write it down. Don't just keep it locked up here. Put it down on a piece of paper, type it out in a note in your phone, and and then I want you to, to look at that situation, look at that scenario, and I want you to ask yourself the question, what will I miss out on if I choose to please people instead of pleasing God? What will I miss out on? Or conversely, what good may happen if I choose to please God in this situation instead of choosing to please this other person? Because if I call Jesus the Lord of my life, then like Jesus, my first priority should be seeking to please God through my words and through my actions. And at times, that's going to upset other people. Yeah, that's, that's how it's going to go sometime. But I hope in those situations that we can remember who it is that we are seeking to please as a response of, of the love that, that He has shown us. Because unlike the philosopher that I quoted to start our time, you know, if, if the key to failure is trying to please everybody, well, I, I can tell you the key to success. It's choosing to please God in everything that I do. Let's pray. Father God, I, I come before you and, and I, I confess there have been so many times, God, where I have chose I've made the choice to to please other people, even if I knew it's not what was going to be, you know, in the best interest of you. God, it's it's hard to even come up with the words for it right now because it's it's embarrassing uh, to think of all the times that I have just lived to please people. And when I look to the example of your son, Jesus, and when I consider what he did for me on the cross, God, I want to live my life in a way that where I am always seeking to please you first. God, help to remind us, God, that our, our words and our actions, God, we don't need to try to earn your love. God, you've already shown us how much you love us through Jesus. God, help us to live in a way that, that we want to please you because of what you've already done for us, God. And knowing that when we please you, 
God, we are living in, in the way that you have designed us to and you will give us our, the very best life as we choose to obey you and to please you. God, I pray that by your spirit, God, that you would work inside of us and remind us to live in a way that is always honoring to you. We thank you and we pray that this time has been glorifying to you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing with us today, Mike. We have so many opportunities for people of all ages, and we want to make sure that you are staying in the loop about it all. The best ways to do that is through our All Church emails, by following us on Instagram and Facebook, or check in anytime at rainierview.org. We'd love to invite you to join one of our winter Rooted sessions. Rooted is a 10-week experience to get you connected to God, the church, serving in our community, and discovering your purpose. If you're looking to dive into a community group at Rainier View, this is the best way to do it. We want everyone here to take part in Rooted and witness the life change that can happen. Signups are live right now, and our next session will start on January 19th. Please visit rainierview.org rooted to sign up today. We're a church that loves to be generous. If you call Rainier View your church home, you can give by simply texting RVCC to 77977 to use our safe and secure online system. You can also give on our website or send in a check. If you're joining us for the first time today, please don't feel any obligation to give. We're just so glad that you're here. We will be together for one last song today. During this song, we encourage you to take communion in your homes. This is just a time we take every week to think about all that Christ did for us on the cross. So gather some bread and juice and take these as reminders of Jesus' body and blood. Thank you again for joining us this morning, and we hope you'll join us again next Sunday right here or at one of our campuses. And I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, and I've seen many searching far and wide but I know they're all searching for answers only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect. In all of your ways to us, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Oh, it's love. So undeniable, I can hardly speak peace. So unexplainable, I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me. 
Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Love You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, you're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us sing that again you're perfect in all your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways. 